the Holy Spirit and the Father's acknowledgement there, his um, testing in the wilderness by Satan, his defeat of Satan and temptation in the wilderness, and his offering, in a sense, himself in the synagogue at Nazareth as the Messiah, where he claims that the prophecy of Isaiah uh, 61 is fulfilled in him, and the people, instead of accepting that, want to throw him off a, a cliff. And after those uh, sort of major things, uh, Luke begins to describe Jesus' ministry. And we've seen a number of things here about healing. Uh, earlier in, in chapter 5, the call of Peter especially, and John and James along with Peter. And this morning we're going to be looking at the call of Levi. So with that little bit of review and introduction, let me ask you to stand and we will pray for the Lord's blessing on his word and read our text this morning. Father in heaven, we've just sung a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to you as the creator of all things. And we thank you for the way that we see your majesty, your power, your wisdom in the creation. And we thank you for the promise of a new creation uh, in which there will be no more curse, no more sin. We thank you that the reason for that is because of your work of redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the record we have of that in Holy Scripture and pray, gracious spirit, for your blessing upon both our reading and reflection upon this portion of your word for the glory and honor of Christ through whom we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear God's word beginning this morning in Luke 5 and verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. Please be seated. I journeyed to Damascus, and at midday I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me. And I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, and I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen in me and to those in which I will appear to you. Now, this was Paul's testimony before Herod Agrippa in Acts 26, and we have a number of different places in the New Testament where Paul shares his testimony. The Apostle Matthew, who was formerly known as Levi, just as Paul was formerly known as Saul, does not share his testimony in the New Testament. But if he had, it would probably be similar to Paul's. Not in the sense of his having been a Pharisee or a persecutor of the church, but in the sense of his call having been very sudden and very unexpected. And I think this is as close as we have here. Matthew's tax booth experience is equivalent, I'm suggesting, to Saul's Damascus Road experience. And I think it's interesting and informative in several very significant ways. Uh, the first one is this. Jesus' call of Levi was an act of grace by him and a blessing to Levi. Jesus' call of Levi was an act of grace on Jesus' part, and it was a great blessing to Levi. Now, we're told in Mark 2 that this occurred in the city of Capernaum, which was Jesus' headquarters. After, after he was rejected in Nazareth, he moved to Capernaum, which was a city there on the, the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Peter and James and John were fishermen there. And Mark says the tax booth was next to the sea, next to the ocean, or, or the sea there where the fishermen were. Taxes were collected from fishermen. And the implication seems to be that Matthew, the tax collector, that was his, um, his assigned place. He had a tax booth there on the, the, the coast where the fishermen would come in, and he would collect taxes from them. Jesus passes by there, and he calls 
Matthew. Now, we don't know because Matthew was in, or Levi at this point, he, he's, he's Levi. Matthew means gift of God, and apparently Jesus at some point changed his name uh, later. But right now he's Levi. Because he was in Capernaum, he may have seen uh, Jesus do miracles. He may have heard uh, Jesus preach and teach. Uh, we're told that there were tax collectors who came to John the Baptist and apparently responded to his teaching. Levi may have been one of those we don't know. But in any event, it was an act of grace for Jesus Christ to call this tax collector. Tax collectors were despised. They served the Roman. They, they collected taxes for the Romans, so they were considered to be traitors, collaborators with the occupiers. And they were also... Uh, often dishonest. They were regarded as thieves because they got paid, uh, they had to collect a certain amount of taxes and give that to Rome and anything over that they could keep for themselves and they often resorted to extortion in order to make more money. So they were a despised group of people and they regarded money as more important than social acceptance. They were willing to be outcast, despised by everybody in order to make money. And this is one of the people that Jesus calls to follow him and Levi's response to this call obviously cost him greatly verse 28 leaving everything he rose and followed him it's interesting uh, in uh, um, verse 29 he's made a great feast for many guests in his home Levi not only owned a home but he apparently owned a large home large enough to accommodate lots of people and to put on a feast. He was a prosperous, successful man, and yet he's willing to leave it all. You remember what it said back in verse 11 when Jesus called Peter and James and John? They had brought their, when they brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. And so it was a gracious call on the part of Jesus to call this despised tax collector to be one of his disciples. It was costly for Levi to respond and leave everything. Apparently, the fishermen could go back to their work, and they did in John 20. We, we hear after Jesus' uh, resurrection that Peter uh, says, I want to go fishing, and James and John, some of the other, they could go back. He's not going to be able to go back to tax collecting. And yet, at the same time, it was more than worth the cost of what he gave up. In Mark 10, 28, Peter began to say to Jesus when Jesus told this rich young ruler, uh, you like one thing. He says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? He says, you know the commandments. He says, I've kept them all for my youth, which of course wasn't true. And Jesus drives the point home. You like one thing, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. And he went away sorrowful because he was very rich. He wasn't willing to do it. And Peter responds and says, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, truly, there's no one who's left houses, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or lands for my sake, who won't receive a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. And so the, the, the results of following Jesus Christ far outweigh for Matthew and for anybody else what we may give up to follow him. But not only that, think of it. Matthew uh, was one of the 12. And so he had for... Two and a half years, probably, he lived intimately with Jesus Christ, walking, observing, eating meals together. What a privilege. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and didn't see it. And to hear what you hear and didn't hear. They got to, to, to be with the Messiah that the prophets had all been longing for. To hear him preach and teach as no man ever did before. To see him heal. To feed the hungry. John 20 verse 30. John says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Of all the things we have recorded in John's gospel, the other gospels, there were other signs that Jesus did in the presence of the disciples that weren't recorded, but Matthew got to see those. So it was a wonderful thing for Matthew to receive and respond to that call. Brothers and sisters, the call to follow Jesus Christ or the call to repentance and faith is a call to total commitment. Luke 14, great multitudes were following him. 
And Jesus turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We're not doing Christ a favor when we believe the gospel and when we follow him. He is doing us a profound favor. No man or woman. I'm old, I'm old enough that I use the generic masculine. When I say man, I'm including you sisters as well. No one ever becomes a loser in any way by following Jesus Christ. Paul said, whatever things were gained to me, and there are indications that Paul came from a wealthy family and that when he, when he left Judaism and, and became an apostle, preaching the gospel, despised and all of that, that his family disowned him. But he says, whatever things were gained to me, I count as lost. I count all things as rubbish. And it could be translated even lower than that compared to the, the wonder and the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. One of the things it shows us is that Jesus Christ uses all kinds of men and women, many that we might not think, many that might be otherwise despised. Jesus is willing and able to use them. It shows his compassion and his condescension. He calls this tax collector. Now, fishermen were relatively low in the social order, but tax collectors were at the very bottom, and yet Jesus calls this one. And the fact that Levi responded, and it, it sounds like he got up. It doesn't suggest there was a long time of wrestling. Jesus said, follow me. He got up and left everything and followed him. Suggests that Jesus had profoundly changed this particular tax collector. Money was no longer the most important thing to him. And that's what sinners need. Brothers and sisters, sinners need two things. They need to be forgiven and they need to be changed, transformed. And the gospel provides for both. Jesus does both. And he obviously not only was uh, forgiving, but changing Levi. That's why Jesus said, don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. It's not an option. It's not, it would be a good idea, but if, no, we have to be. By nature, we're dead in sins. We're hostile to God until we're given new hearts. But that's part of what the Lord does when he saves us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that was a verse that was the Lord used when I was hitchhiking in Europe at 17 and met some Christians who witnessed to me. And I remember one of these guys as we were at lunch telling me how he'd come to know Christ in a personal way and he changed his life. And he showed me 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. I was at a place where I, I wanted and needed to be changed. And I hadn't been able to do it myself. And the Lord used that verse to encourage me greatly. And obviously he's at work doing that in Levi's life. Has the Lord called you to follow him? Has he ever spoken those words to you yet? Not physically and audibly, but really and truly to your heart. Through his word, through a sermon, through a friend. How have you responded to that call? Jesus Christ deserves our supreme devotion and love. He's worthy of that. Is there anything or anyone else that you love more than you love him? A rival to him in your heart? If that's the case, you're robbing him. He deserves, as the almighty creator, as the redeemer, he deserves and is worthy of our highest love and devotion. But you're not only robbing him, you're robbing yourself. Because if you love and serve anything less, then you're cheating yourself as well. So one thing that Levi's call illustrates for us is the rich and wonderful extent of God's grace to sinners, calling them to trust and follow Jesus Christ. And no matter what it may cost us, and sometimes it costs us greatly. There, you know, there, there are places in the world, countries, where to become a Christian, especially to be baptized, because that's a formal act of, of, of uh, submitting to Christ's lordship. And in some context, you're renouncing your former religion. You could be killed. It's happening. It may not happen that way, but it can be costly. But no matter what it costs us, it's worth it. It's a great blessing 
and you'll gain infinitely more than you lose in the bargain. So that's one thing I think we see here. A second thing is that Jesus' call of Levi opened doors for ministry to other needy sinners. Jesus' call to Levi opened doors for ministry to other needy sinners. Jesus' call to Levi opened the door for ministry to tax collectors and other sinners. Verse 29, Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. Now, you know, we don't typically recline at table. We sit. But in that context, and especially at banquets, they had couches where they would uh, lie on the couch on an elbow with a common table and so on. But uh, this was a large crowd. Again, Matthew had a big house and uh, was able to uh, sustain this. But it says a large company of tax collectors and others. Who were the others? Prostitutes, thugs of various kinds, sinners of various kinds. Again, those are the circles that, that Matthew uh, typically ran in and they had the opportunity Jesus had the opportunity took the opportunity to meet them and no doubt to, to preach and share the gospel with them as he uh, was there rubbing shoulders with them and just to share a meal like that suggested uh, real fellowship we're about to do that here in a few minutes and and to eat a meal together suggested a, a certain level of friendship it even at times meant a covenant i don't think there was a covenant here but it was it was jesus being uh, accessible here behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i'll come into him and eat with him <clears throat> so there's real fellowship going on here but jesus called a levi opened the door to minister to other kinds of sinners the Pharisees, verse 30, and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This gave Jesus an opportunity to minister to sinners of another kind, to the self-righteous. Those who were proud and thought that they didn't uh, need any kind of help they were offended by jesus familiarity and accessibility to these social and religious outcasts and jesus takes the opportunity of their complaining to speak to them about the true nature of himself and his ministry and of us now jesus says i didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance i don't think he's implying here that anybody really is ultimately righteous we're all sinners but at least in an outward form or religious way, they were more righteous than, you know, the, uh, the tax collectors and these other sinners. But he says, I've come to minister to the spiritual sick and the spiritual needy, which is really ultimately all of us. It's interesting. There are three passages in Luke that put tax collectors over against um, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the self-righteous who want to elevate themselves above sinners. The prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son, if you read Luke 15, 1, it was because Jesus was hanging out with these various sinful people that the, the, the scribes and Pharisees complained and he told the parable of the prodigal son about that son who took his father's inheritance and squandered it in the far country on prostitutes and other things. And then he came to himself, he returned. His father didn't lock him outside and say, uh, you know, you spend a couple of uh, days on the porch outside the door on your knees and maybe we'll talk. No, the father saw him when he was a long way off. He's looking for him. And he runs to him and greets him. And before the son can even finish his speech, he's, he's hugged him. He says, bring a robe and shoes and, and, and make a banquet. And then his brother, his self-righteous brother, complains and won't even come in and eat because he says, I've always been so good and you've never given me a part. In Luke 18, the parable of the tax collector and the sinner praying in, in the temple. And uh, I'm sorry, the tax collector and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm so much holier than this tax collector here. I, he lists all the things he does, and the tax collector won't even lift his eyes. He just says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, he's the one who went away justified, not the proud, self-righteous man. In Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector. Luke was apparently, uh, um, Levi was, there are several levels of tax collectors. Levi was an, a tax collector on the ground. There was a higher level who kind of managed and overseed. That was Zacchaeus. 
and he was extremely wealthy. But of course, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, let me come to your house. And people were offended. Why is he going to the house of the sinner? But it was because he knew he was going to repent. Paul says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Jesus, and that passage about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 10, I've come to seek and to save the lost. And brothers, think of Jesus' ministry to that uh, woman at the well in John chapter 4, who'd been married five times and was living with a man who wasn't her husband. He ministered to her. He knew all about her. He ministered to her, and she went away and told the people in the village. And so he wound up having the opportunity to minister to even more people as all those people from the village came to him. A similar situation here. And one of the things I think this should underscore for us is our true nature. We are all sinners, guilty in the eyes of God. And the true audience and target of the gospel and the nature of the church it's just a group of helpless, forgiven sinners from every kind of class, social class, ethnic group without exception. One of the other things that shows us in the reaction of these scribes and Pharisees is the awful danger of pride, especially the pride of self-righteousness. That somehow, in and of myself, I'm better. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble and those who are proud of how righteous and holy they are for robbing themselves of that grace. It shows us the beauty and the benefits of humility and the many reasons for it. Brothers and sisters, Paul asked the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 because they were arrogant. He says that in 1 Corinthians 3 or 4 times. You're arrogant. He asked this question. What do you have? that you have not received? And of course, it's a rhetorical question. The implied answer is nothing. Brothers and sisters, we don't, have, we don't have a breath. Every breath we draw, every beat of our hearts is a gift of God. And if we ever get to hear the gospel, and if we understand it when we hear it, if we feel our need, if we come in repentance and faith to the Lord, that, that's a gift. Nothing we can say, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just smarter. I'm just better than those other people who heard and didn't believe. No. And so it shows us the many reasons for humility. A broken and contrite heart. David says in Psalm 51, God will not despise. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to be on our guard against self-righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pursue holiness. We're called to do that, but not self-righteousness. And as we, make, uh, uh, as we make progress in growth, spiritual growth, a life of holiness, it should make us thankful to God and humble, not proud, because it's only by grace. It's interesting, Jesus demonstrates it's possible to remain holy while still reaching out to and having contact with sinners. Now, he didn't go to the brothels to minister to the prostitutes. He didn't go out and get drunk to minister to people who had a drinking problem. But there were contexts and situations where he was willing and able, quite willing and able to, to rub shoulders and minister to them in order to minister the gospel to them and so we need to be willing to do that and, and uh, not resist reaching out to the lowliest the most needy and the most sinful am i or are we aggressively calling sinners to repentance reaching out to them lovingly doesn't mean that you you know stand up and look down your nose at them but uh ministering to them calling to repentance would everyone who comes to Pathway feel welcome? James 2 talks about churches where a rich man comes in. They say, here, let me give you the best seat. A poor man comes in and you can sit here by my feet. You know, there's a tendency, again, various things. It could be uh, money, financial, social, whatever, to treat people differently. But no, we need to have a welcoming attitude toward everyone. Now, that doesn't mean we can't be wise. There are people who will try to take advantage of Christians. They will try to use them to get money and other things. 
So this doesn't preclude our being wise, but at the same time, I think this shows us that we're to be gracious as well. And it shows us everyone has a circle of contacts. Levi used his circle to minister. He invited his fellow tax collectors and others. We don't know who the others were, other people he knew. And we all have a circle, family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, whatever. Are you praying for them? Are you looking and asking the Lord for opportunities to share the gospel with your circle? Do you have a plan of how you might be able to do that? You're ready to share your testimony with them if the Lord opens that door, or have a, a tract or something you could give them to read. This is one of the purposes of uh, the community groups. That we're hoping and praying, you be praying, we'll be starting in April, the first one we hope to start next month. And the idea again is just to provide and facilitate a way for people to draw on their context to meet with Christ. So another thing our text shows us this morning is that as wonderful as the call and conversion of one sinner is, it can also be an opportunity for Christ to reach out and save many others. There's one last point I'd like us to think about briefly, and that's this, that Jesus' call of Levi also enriched the entire church. The entire Christian church for 2,000 years has been enriched because Jesus said to that tax collector, follow me, and he left everything and followed. Jesus' call of Levi also enriched the entire church. Now, Matthew's, and again, he was his original name was Levi. Matthew, gift of God. Apparently, at some point, Jesus, or he changed his name. We don't know, but he everywhere else he's called Matthew. Uh, he became an apostle. Uh, one of the 12 that were selected by Jesus to be with him and to be sent out to teach. And we have in the Gospels how Jesus sent them out to teach in Galilee and in Judea and in, in the Holy Land to the Jews. He said, don't go to uh, those you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was their initial training. And Matthew was one of those who went out and preached and healed and cast out demons. And then Jesus gave the great commission, go to all the nations. And we don't know, we've got a, a record in the book of Acts about Paul's ministry and how he took the gospel to the nations. Uh, we don't know about Matthew. Church, uh, church tradition says he spent a lot of time in Palestine, but later in his life and ministry, he did go to the Gentiles and died as a martyr. We don't know where, there are different records of where he supposedly died, but apparently his whole life was spent in, in preaching and teaching and serving the Lord until he died as a martyr. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 19, you're no longer strangers and aliens. That's us Gentiles is talking about. You're fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. The apostles are in a real sense the foundation, part of the foundation of the church, their work, their writings. Matthew is one of those. Revelation 21 says the wall of the city, the new Jerusalem, has 12 foundations and the 12 names of the apostles of the Lamb are on those foundations. That says something about how important the apostles were. Matthew's one of those names. But you know what? The Lord blessed the church through Matthew in another way for 2,000 years through his writing ministry, the Gospel of Matthew. Now, tax collectors had to be able to write. And it's possible that Matthew even knew a form of shorthand. It's possible he may have actually taken down almost word for word much of Jesus' teaching as he was going with him listening. We don't know for sure, but it's possible. Ancient accounts assert that Matthew's was the first gospel written, although originally written in Aramaic, not Greek. And it was called a gospel for the Hebrews because he was writing particularly for the Jewish people to convince them that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the son of David. And that's why he quotes so often about Old Testament scripture being fulfilled. And that's why the genealogy at the very beginning begins with Abraham and goes through David. Like Dr. Luke, the Lord used Dr. Luke's gifts as a writer, as a historian, uh, to give us the, the Gospel of Luke and the, and, and the Book of Acts. He used Matthew's gifts to give us that wonderful Gospel. 
And one of the things it shows us, brothers and sisters, is the rich diversity of the church. It's interesting in the list of the apostles we have in the Gospels, very often Levi or Matthew the tax collector is right next to Simon the zealot. You know what a zealot was? Zealots were people who were ardent patriots. They hated the Romans and anybody who collaborated with them. They would carry knives with them, and if they had a chance, uh, they would kill uh, a Roman soldier or a tax collector, people who were considered to be um, collaborators. We don't know anything about how Jesus called Simon the Zealot, but he called him, he changed his heart, and here he and Matthew and some of these fishermen that might have hated Matthew, we have to pay taxes to that Levi all the time, and yet here they are joined together in the same apostolic band. And it shows something about the communion of the saints and the fellowship of the church, how the Lord takes such different people and joins them together in a bond of love because they're all united to Christ, children of the same heavenly father and dwelt by the same gracious spirit. It shows his ability to use everyone, even you and me, when we're submitted to Jesus Christ. We're willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll give up everything and follow you and how he can use us in ways we would never have imagined. I'm sure Matthew had no idea when Jesus called him and he left everything to follow him. He had no idea that he would be used the way he was. Are you being a good steward of your gifts, the gifts the Lord has given you? Your body, your possessions, your natural and spiritual gifts, your time and energy, they surrender to the Lord, say, Lord, use me, use all I am, all I have to serve you and your kingdom. The gift of his word, are you... I'm glad you're here to hear it today. Are you reading it? And more important, meditating upon it, applying it, and sharing it when you get the chance. The gift and the privilege of prayer, purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, the privilege of coming to God as your Father all the time. Are you making good use of that gift? And the, the opportunities he gives you to witness and minister in various other ways. So, to summarize, three points this morning, brothers and sisters, the call of Levi was an act of grace. Uh, the, Jesus' call of Levi was an act of grace by him, and it was a great blessing to Levi. Uh, Jesus' call of Levi opened doors for ministry to other needy sinners, and Jesus' call of Levi also enriched the entire church. I alluded earlier to that parable that Jesus told in Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the tax collector praying in the temple. And the Pharisee saying, God, I thank you. I'm not like this tax collector and listing all the things he does. I fast and I tithe and do all these things. And the tax collector, not even willing to look up in his humility, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, he's the one who went off justified. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's no way for us to know for sure, but it's not impossible that, humanly speaking, that parable may have been inspired by Jesus' dealings with this tax collector and those Pharisees and the contrast between them. But whether that's the case or not, there's no denying that Levi was one tax collector who was not only justified, but richly blessed and greatly used as a result of his response to Jesus' gracious call that day by the Sea of Galilee Follow me. In response, Levi left everything and followed him. May the Lord help you and me to do the same thing. Amen. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Again, our gracious Father, we marvel at the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, so holy that the angels, uh, as they beheld his, his glory and holiness in heaven, had to cover their eyes, would come into this fallen world, live among us sinners for 33 years, and call a man a tax collector like Levi to be one of his most intimate disciples. And yet we know it's true, and we thank you that you continue day after day around the world through the gospel to call helpless needy, hell-deserving sinners
to come to you and you forgive them and change them. Oh Lord, if there's anyone here who has yet to hear that call and respond to it, may they do it today. And for those who have, would you give us grace to follow ever more closely and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.